I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 14th of January, 2024. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a viewer question or comment as to just how bad is the driving or how bad are the drivers here in Nicaragua. If you are used to driving around the US, you know that there's a big variety between different parts of the United States, how they drive, how bad they drive, which areas are culturally more uh, in tune with their driving versus places where it's a little bit more uh, frenetic. Well, we're going to talk about what it's like here in Nicaragua when we get back from the bump. All right, welcome to today's show. Today we're recording on the Fuji again. We're on for the first time the TT Artisan 27 millimeter uh, f 2.8 limited edition orange lens, which I was very excited to be able to get. This is the one that I saw that it came out in orange and instantly ordered without uh, any further consideration. And I love how it looks. And especially since I have a KNF tripod that is also black and orange, the entire thing matches by coincidence, other than the fact that I really love orange, but I didn't make any real like effort to coordinate that. And I didn't buy the KNF because KNF's color is orange. That was just uh, the luck of the draw. Uh, last night, I actually managed to go out and do some filming for the first time with the Fuji XS20 out in uh, Via Via, just here in Leon. But the band Med Heavier was was out, and he reached out to us and was like, "Hey, can can the Nika Rumba team come out and see us tonight?" And we're like, "You know what? Actually, we can make it work, and we've got the new equipment to try out." But we're like, we're we're testing, so no promises that we're going to get any recording at all. And uh, uh, so we did our first real test. <laughs> an event and honestly it went really well we managed to make it over two hours without the camera overheating a single time we don't know how close we were to the line but it, you know it's at night so it's not as hot during the day it would definitely have overheated at some point and we went through less than two batteries and in fact i think just a little bit more than one battery uh for the entire event and and the entire recorded amount was probably two and a half hours uh, by the time it was edited it was about an hour and 55 minutes and for those who are interested head over to the at nika rumba channel here on youtube and you can see that that is the latest video if you're watching this in real time. If not, just look for around uh, January uh, 20th with uh, Mad Heavier at Via Via Leon. Should be able to find it without a problem. It's about two hours long. Now, I'll tell you, the image coming off the camera is fantastic. I love how good this looks. And for the record, we shot it on the Suri uh, 56 millimeter F1.2. The whole thing shot at F1.2. Uh, once in a while, it did focus seek, so that was a negative but overall it went really well. It's, it's able to handle the light, no problem. Just absolutely gorgeous image shot on Provia, of course, uh, for low light, but um, the thing that is not so perfect with it is the microphone setup is set up as a default, which is really meant for this. And it's the same mic that I'm talking on right now, which sounds fantastic. But when you go to the 100 decibels higher than I am right now, environment of Via Via on a concert night, it blows out the microphone pretty dramatically. So that's something I have to figure out. I believe I can hook up the, cam the, the microphone to my computer and adjust the gain on it and take it down 12 decibels. And hopefully that's enough to cause it not to clip out of control. And, and we're just gonna see. There's a big learning curve. The fact that I have to go on a computer to adjust the gain on the microphone though is not great. That means I have to either pre-adjust it for every environment or get there and figure out what to do, like have a computer with me, plug it in, change the gain, and like that's so awkward. So that is uh, certainly a negative to the microphone. Of course, the one it replaces, I couldn't adjust the gain. So I mean, that I have the option is awfully nice, but that it's not like a switch on the side, I'm certainly already on my first week of using it, feeling that that is a limitation. But beyond that, the recording went fantastic. So ignore the clipping, everything else, you can check out the video and it's a good concert. Um, and, uh, and of course, I would appreciate everyone heading over there. All the views, the likes, the subscribes over there, they make a big difference for us. All right, today's topic. 
what about driving in Nicaragua? We've talked about like legalities and other, you know, what licenses you need and, and how you do it and all that kind of stuff in other videos and why you may or may not want to do it. But let's talk about how hard it actually is. So I've lived, I, I grew up in the United States, so I'm very familiar with what driving is like there. I grew up in New York, but I lived a long time in Texas. They're very different driving places. Um, in New York, you tend to find drivers that are very confident. Texas, I would describe as very fearful drivers. People go very slowly. They're very erratic. Um, they, they tend to get very aggressive. Um, New York tends to be very different than that. Like you really notice moving between those parts of the country. Um, and it follows more of a general thing. Like you feel in Texas a general sense of fearfulness just in general, like it's, it's a very much a part of society. People are afraid of everything, right? People are always worried about something. That is very much the Texas culture. Uh, so you feel that when you're driving and scared drivers are dangerous drivers. So that you, you, you tend to have this, everyone provides lots and lots of open space. Everyone has big wide lanes and, and huge uh, excess in, of roads and big parking lots because people are very fearful of the cars and of each other and they, they need space to do everything and it has to be very it's kind of simplified. New York is very similar, but not quite that dramatic. Well, if you were to move to Europe, for example, one of the things that drivers notice when you first move to Europe, beyond the fact that everything is a stick shift, same here in Central America, basically the whole world is on stick shift except for the United States uh, and Canada. Not entirely true, but it's very true. You don't really expect just how dramatic it is that the whole world uses stick except the US but beyond that most of the world also has much narrower roads uh, roads like in the middle of cities can be very tiny parking can be very very tight um, often you're on a uh, hilly terrain that the US does not normally put roads on there's a bunch of these little subtle things that you don't really think about until you're driving in other places and when you're driving in the US you can pretty much safely anywhere there's exceptions like San Francisco but they're very few you can basically get behind the wheel of a car and feel confident that you're going to be able to drive almost anywhere with absolutely no physical challenge. It will be easy. It may be slow. There may be a lot of traffic. There may be, you know, a long distance that you got to go. The big challenge is staying awake on really far distances, things like that. But you know that the, the road is generally going to be flat. The space is going to be enough that you don't have to wonder if your car is going to fit or anything like that. In Europe, it is extremely common that if you're driving a car larger than like an itty bitty little smart car, there is a risk that your car won't fit down a road you may turn down. And I have certainly seen situations where smart cars go down a road and can take an hour to navigate a single turn with people standing outside the car, having them move an inch at a time, literally an inch back and forth, trying to turn the car just enough to squeeze it down the next length of road. These are actual ways that people drive in Europe. You don't tend to do that every day, but some people actually do. And if you're driving around Europe, any degree. Now, maybe if you live in Berlin or something, you could do a lot of driving and not have to deal with this kind of thing. But if you're going around, especially like Mediterranean Europe or uh, Alpine Europe or something like that, you are extremely likely to run into situations where either you're driving and or your parking are just physically challenging. Whether or not you can fit a car somewhere, whether it can navigate a turn, whether it can handle the, the incline or decline of the road, uh, whether it can it can make the, the turn radius. Is there someone coming and you have to go around a blind corner? Uh, do you have to uh, suddenly do a physical drop, shift gears and get it around a corner before it slams into a wall? All kinds of things that are actually physically demanding are part of the driving experience. And I'm not saying I'd recommend that. I think America has this figured out, right? <laughs> like this is now part of it is Europe can't fix a lot of this. They have a very mountainous terrain. They have a very uh, ocean front or, or Mediterranean front terrain where they really can't do much. And they have a lot of very old towns whose roads were laid out in hilly areas prior to the advent of cars and they have to work around what they have or in some places like Cordoba, España, uh, they have the, the parking is underneath the old city walls and somehow you have to drop the car by quite, you know, 15 feet in a matter of very short distance and you only have so much to work with and you gotta get it into a, it's just challenging. So people drive much smaller cars, they drive stick to have more control, they learn to handle these situations it's hard. And so when you're driving in Europe, you learn very quickly that it can be a physical challenge. And that 
could be very daunting, especially to Americans who that's not how you learn to drive. We very much are taught that driving is predictable and sane and never a physical challenge. As long as you're paying attention and you don't even have to pay that close of attention, you should pay a lot of attention. I'm not saying not to pay attention, but you can reasonably not pay that close of attention in American driving and generally you're going to be fine. And at no point is it, I'm in a situation where I don't know if I can navigate the car through this scenario. There can be during accidents, but the thing that you're navigating around there is other drivers, right? Moving obstacles, a tree falling over, something like that. But never is the road as designed. If you were the only driver in the world and the roads were all empty, would you still be challenged on whether or not you could navigate the road? But in Europe, if you were the only driver and everyone else was gone and it was a perfectly clear day, bright sunlight, no, or maybe, you know, a nice overcast, so you have that perfect visibility, you're the only car around, you know there's no other cars around, much of Europe is still physically challenging to drive around. So that's, those are incredible disparities. And I'm sure lots of regions of the world have bits of both. Here in Central America, we tend to lean towards European driving to some degree, not as extreme though. So we get kind of a blend, like I was saying. So here we tend to not have super tight streets and super tight parking. We tend to have tight streets, tighter than the US would have, but not as tight as much of Europe has. So it's very rare, but it does exist, where you could be going down a road and suddenly find yourself unable to fit down the road any further. I have found this myself, I think only in Didiamba, where suddenly I turned around a corner and went, I don't think my car is going to go forward here. Like it, it we're going to hit both walls. Um, so that was, that was very surprising that it felt like Europe all of a sudden. And it was not in a spot where I expected it at all. I had no idea it was even hilly there. Um, and it was all kinds of like complicated things. Um, it, I've been in Matagalpa. I've been in spots where cars couldn't make it up the hill. I've been in Managua and been in situations where I was unwilling to go forward because I wasn't sure if the brakes would hold the car on such a steep decline. Uh, so there are spots like that, but by and large, I can drive around any place I would, normally go in Managua and the roads are relatively flat. There's the occasional hill, but it's really minor. You know, it's yes, we're, we're, we're going up, but it's not the kind of thing where you worry about it or think about it at all here in Leon, right? Generally quite flat. There's no spot where you really worry about the hills or anything like that. Maybe if you get outside of town, you're going to like, you know, going up to the, the fortress or something, there's a little bit, but even there very, very minor. I don't think you would even notice if driving up there. So in general, we don't have a lot of the really tough hills, but they do exist, especially in Matagalpa, probably more than anywhere else, Hinotega a little bit. What we do have is a lot of um, small towns where you may get really rough roads. It won't be that it's a sudden hill dropping off. It won't be that it's so tight your car won't fit down, but it could be that the road is so rough that your car can't clear the obstacles on the road or something of that nature. That's very real. And so there's a lot of that, but that's not, generally scary. You look forward, you go, oh, that road's really rough. I'm not going to go down that, or I'm going to take my chances, or I'm going to come back with a truck, something like that. Typically in Europe, you can't come back with a truck because your challenges are normally space related uh, and, and a truck would actually make it worse. But if you're uh, here in, in Central America, typically a truck with high clearance and four by four traction will solve whatever problem you have. So it depends on the scenario in different regions of the world. And here as well, there are spots where a truck would not fit like the place in Didiamba, but in general, a truck makes it easier, not harder. So your mileage is gonna vary, but parking a truck in the city is a pain, especially here in Leon and Granada, which are colonial cities. So our roads are the tightest. Matagalpa is probably the next hardest because of the mountains. It just has all those. When you build cities on mountainsides, you have restrictions and it gets really complicated because of that. But if you're driving around a Messiah or a Granada where they're kind of open and flat, it's only old colonial road spaces between buildings that you have to worry about. And it's generally not that bad. Um, and if you're in like Managua, which has been rebuilt, I don't know any spot that's actually bad. Managua, other than a couple hills that are just too steep, is, is very easy from that perspective. Now that wasn't the question that was that was kind of a background to what the lay of the physical land is like now let's talk about drivers and driving so the original question was just how crazy are the drivers in nicaragua and i'm going to break this up into different categories if you're a truck or a car driver generally i'm actually going to say they're not that crazy and in fact i think you'll find that they're pretty good 
it's difficult to evaluate for an American, for example, because in the United States, we tend to have extremely strict driving laws. For example, if the posted speed is 80 kilometers an hour, you would go well, between 80 and 90 kilometers an hour, that would be expected. And it would simply be, if you went over a certain amount, that would be a problem, and if you didn't, you know, you're fine. And here, everything is a guideline, and it may be used in case of an accident or something like that, but, for example, a red light does not mean you have to stay until it becomes green. It simply means you have to stop, make sure that no one's coming, and as long as it's clear, you can go, which is great. I think most people would agree that, well, that's not a bad system, but it's different because the United States does not work that way. They say you're going to stop, and there's reasons for that. If you have poor visibility, sometimes you don't want someone taking a risk and then someone coming from a blind corner and T-boning them because they thought there was no car coming. So there's reasons why the U.S. system has advantages. But there's a million times that you're stuck at an intersection and you're like, I know no one can get to me. All I have to do is cross this asphalt for 10 feet. And I'll be clear, why am I sitting at a red light for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes? And in the United States, if those lights break, which is not common, but we've all experienced it, when a light breaks, what do you do? Technically, you're never allowed to go, right? Like you actually, and you're not allowed to turn around because you're not allowed to turn around at an intersection and you're not allowed to go forward because the light is red. You're actually stuck in limbo indefinitely until the power goes out. That's a problem. Now, of course, most police are going to look the other way, but they don't know that the light's been out unless they've been sitting there with you, right? So all kinds of complications come up. And I have sat at lights for five minutes before and been like, I must just have to run this light. And it did eventually change. But how do you know whether it's 30 seconds or five minutes or 20 minutes, right? Because you don't know. And there are actually lights that take in excess of five minutes, very rare. But all it takes is there being one, and you don't know if you're at one of the ones that goes that long. So here, if you're stuck at a light and you're just sitting there and you're like, what is going on? You can go, right? It's, it's that simple. And we find it here in Sutiava, for example. We have one light in Sutiava, and in the middle of the night, it is extremely common that you will come to it, be at a red light, and there are no other cars on the road, and there will not be any other cars on the road for several minutes. You have a completely empty highway, you can definitely see in every direction once you've come to a you know you come to a stop but you look around and go there's no way someone's gonna hit me and then you just go and that's fine and the police could be standing right there and they'd be like of course you just go right if the police are behind you they'll honk at you to go right so that's how it works so you have some of those kinds of differences and that can feel especially to an american like it's a little bit more erratic driving simply because it's not as predictable and it is not as uh, it was just not the same, and anything that's not the same is going to feel like it's a little bit erratic because it feels erratic to you. Uh, so it's got some of that. But in general, I think you'll find, and this is very in general, right? But I think you'll find that car and truck drivers, people in large vehicles, are generally pretty good within the the confines of or the context of this more flexible driving rule system. So once you accommodate for that, I think you'll find the drivers are pretty decent. And part of that is that, uh, you know, lanes are suggestions, lights are suggestions, stop signs are suggestions, speed limits are suggestions for the most part. Passing lanes are not suggestions. Don't pass in the wrong lane. Uh, turn it when you turn, you have to be in a correct lane. Those are all much more strict than in the US actually. Um, but in general, most of the rules are more lax. There's a few things you just have to know. Now, one of the things that's really dramatic, and this is what makes everything seem so crazy, is the insane amount of things in the road in Central America. And this is a much broader thing than Nicaragua. When I lived in Panama, which is much more American styled than Nicaragua, I mean, it would only take you a few minutes of being in Panama after having been in Nicaragua and you go, yep, I can see that this is much more like the US, whether it's US influence or just they ended up that way. I don't, I'm not going to comment, but that the, the road laws, that the stores, that the way that people interact with each other leans far more towards a cultural alignment with the United States than with Nicaragua is very immediately obvious. And Costa Rica is very much the same way. In Panama, if you're driving on those roads, you're going to have roads that feel more like the US, driving patterns that feel more like the US and you're still going to have random people who just jump in front of your car on the middle of the fastest highway in the country. They will wait after the road has been empty for three minutes and they will wait until you are just barely able to miss them and they will run in front of your car. I have no idea why. There's no sense of self-preservation when it comes to being on the road. And here in Nicaragua, it is exactly the same. Every single person you see on the side of the road, there is a 
easy 50 50 chance that they will just walk into the front of your car if you let them i just last night nearly had a motorcycle drive straight into the side of my car you may think i was crossing at an intersection i wasn't i was going up a side street in the middle of the road and the middle of the city and the motorcycle was parked on the side as i go past the parked motorcycle he turned 90 degrees and gunned it and i had to dodge he had to dodge he was going sideways across the road into a building's wall and almost hit me, which would have been good for him. I would have softened the blow rather than the concrete wall he was about to hit. But that's how insane it is. And this was not like, you know, some little cheap bike and someone just learning. This was like an expensive roadster with like all the extra bags. He just went perpendicular to the road. No reason, no warning, no nothing. He was, I was in traffic. I was not the only car. There was a car directly in front of me a car directly behind me we're at a busy road that always has a lines of cars he was just sitting on the side crank the wheel and hit it right absolutely crazy but that kind of stuff happens non-stop i've had people on bicycles dart directly in the front of the car where i had to dodge to such a degree i almost jumped a sidewalk to get away from a person who was just trying to get hit by the car it's nuts and those are the people right on top of that you have animals that are everywhere now the animals here tend to have a lot of self-preservation so dogs cats horses things like that cows they're going to be in the road but they tend to do a really good job of getting out of your way as long as you give them the the chance to get out of the way they're going to get out of the way right they do not want to get hit and they are paying attention the thing you have to worry about is when there's like a lot of noise or bright lights and things and they, they get confused and they don't know where to go or they can't tell you're coming that's when there's risk but as long as you're paying attention and know that animals could be confused and wander into the road, you know that animals could be in the road, that you're always watching for that. We tend to have to be extremely alert because of that, but we, it, it, it actually isn't so bad. Like you're always worried about it and I hate that, right? And I'm not saying that animals never get hit, they certainly do, but the frequency of them getting hit is nothing like you would expect. With the number of animals in the road, you would think you would be running over animals all the time and that is not the case but you do have to be careful and you do have to stay alert. But I grew up in New York and the number of just white-tailed deer that jump into the road wanting you to hit them at any cost, they will do anything they can to get hit by your car, is absurd. And so, you know, living in New York, it was more common to hear that people had hit a deer in the road than it is to hear people hit anything here. So the, while it's crazy and I hate it that there's so many animals in the road, it is and it's something that could be fixed in theory for the most part, not 100%, but could be much improved. It really isn't as bad as it seems because the animals probably through evolutionary elimination of those that did not preserve themselves do such a good job of keeping themselves safe. But the humans routinely, everybody talks about it. If you drive here or just ride around a bit, the amount that people will cross roads, little children, elderly, people in in wheelchairs normal people that are shopping going about their business for work or whatever they will step directly into traffic and never even make eye contact to figure out if you've seen them or not right now you know it's one thing to trust someone to not intentionally run you over it's another thing to trust that they were not distracted by someone else doing the same thing because you're constantly worried about every person on the sidewalk stepping out into traffic and you have to and there's the, the roads are tighter than in the u.s so much of the driving you may have plants or something it's easy to have you know just a couple feet in front of the car someone could step out and and you could clip them and never have visibility to know that they were there so you really have to be alert and that's where it feels really crazy but it's not because the driving is crazy it's because the obstacles you have to avoid are crazy most of those people i assume have never driven a vehicle and do not understand how physically difficult it is to pay attention to so many obstacles potentially jumping in front of the car and deciding which ones to give a little extra buffer to and you know like driving through Sutiava is a perfect example when you drive through Sutiava you have a boulevard with plants in the middle so your the plants are are often hitting your mirror on the on the driver's side so you're very close there's not a problem they're like bushes right so so it's not hurting anything but if a person will cross between the bushes and when they even just peer out to see if a car is coming, you could clip them, right? So you have to be very careful. They have to be very careful. If they step out in any way whatsoever, you may not have a chance to dodge. So you may think, well, I would drive a little bit farther away from that barrier, but people tend to park cars directly on the other side. So you only have maybe a foot, two feet at most 
to have extra space there. That you may say, well, okay, but I'm gonna lean towards the cars rather than, even though doors open quite often and you would clip people and you'd knock mirrors, the bigger problem is that there's also people coming out from between the cars, often people walking alongside the cars on the roadside, not the sidewalk side. But yes, there's a sidewalk there. There's a perfectly safe way to walk. And you have a nonstop flow of bicycles, motorcycles, and tricyclos. That's the three wheel tricycle things where you push people around that go and get into that space as well. So you're often trying not to kill a person who just doesn't care and is in this really dangerous space while trying to pay attention to someone who may pop out over here. That's why it feels erratic and you can't leave space in the spots you need to because there isn't enough room. And if you did leave some room, someone would put a vehicle into that space. The instant that you have any space around your car, a bicycle or a motorcycle will zip into that space and take it up. So you sometimes you actually don't leave space for safety right so that kind of stuff that's where it gets really dangerous so the drivers that you actually have to worry about are the motorcycles the bicycles and the tricyclos um and the tuk-tuks right all that kind of stuff the caponeras as they're called here but we mostly know them as tuk-tuks in english those are plentiful they're all over the country and they will completely get into your way they will they will radically turn in the road you'll have all kinds of problems where you're sure they would never do that they would certainly be killed and they'll just do it right so you have to really pay attention to that and because of all this um i think it's very hard to see driving in nicaragua as not being erratic it's hard not to see it that way it but it's not that the driving's erratic it's that their obstacle avoidance is so dynamic, it's so robust, and they have to be. And so because of this, I would say that my feeling is that in general, more, not just compared to Texas, but compared to all of the United States, I find that the drivers in Nicaragua tend towards being more competent, far more aware, and far less fearful, because you have to be relatively brave just to get behind the wheel of a car. And they're doing all of this with universally manual stick shift cars, which, gives some more control but adds more things that you have to think about so you're dealing with all this driving mechanisms while and there's just constant noise and, and you're hearing things from outside the car uh, so it's very difficult to use your ears in the way that that's another thing in the united states you can generally listen for a lot of stuff going on and be like okay i don't hear anyone coming that tells me something and here there's always noise so you're always hearing something that could be an obstacle about to, to come into play or something that's about to hit you. You're really difficult to watch all those things. And, and this may not be obvious, but because of the, uh, the um, proximity to the equator that we have here, it is extremely bright most days, making visibility actually pretty tough. You want overcast, but not with fog or anything, for your optimum visibility. You want that lower total threshold of light because your eyes just can't handle full bright sunlight and even worse the snow of course so glad we don't have that but it is often so bright that you're like really squinting uh during the day trying to drive and that can make visibility a bit more difficult and and very hard to see obstacles uh because of the lack of contrast so if you get that uh, overcast days, you'll suddenly find driving here much easier. And driving at night is relatively difficult because you tend to have three things beyond the obstacles in the road, often which the most of the time have no way to be seen. If it's an animal, they're obviously just dark objects in the darkness. Uh, if it's a person on a bicycle, the chances that they have a reflector, very low. And if you have a vehicle that is not uh, a bicycle, there's a really decent chance, maybe one in 20 vehicles has no lights. Now, they should be getting pulled over for that, and from time to time they are, but there's an awful lot of them that manage to stay on the road or get onto the road when you're out doing stuff. So you can be going down a highway, have what you think is really good visibility, and slam into the back of a, of a truck that is in the road, complete in darkness, and it was just going so much slower than you that you ran right into it without knowing. And sometimes they'll park vehicles like that in the middle of the road. Now, if a, if a vehicle stops in the road, they're required by law to put out reflectors way out in front and have all these things. They're not allowed to drive without those in the car but there's a big gap between this is the law and this is what you have to do, and it's always what people do. Obviously, they're also supposed to have lights on their vehicles and they're supposed to turn them on, but they don't all the time. So those things make it just outrageously dangerous at night. And you combine that, that's the first piece. Then you combine that with many people drive with their brights on. Of course, that happens in America too, but it feels like it happens more here. And I think people angle their lights a little bit more uh, up here, at least sometimes. So you're, you're getting an awful lot of outrageously bright lights um, 
for some reason, I find that the windscreens tend to be dirtier here. I don't know if that's just my experience. It feels like there's more challenges with the windscreens getting dirty faster. Um, and so you have a tendency towards a lot of glare and there is uh, much less street lighting. Uh, just in general in Nicaragua than say in the United States. Um, there is street lights. Uh, there are street lights, I should say. The, the streets are lit, but there are much larger areas without street lights. The street lights are not as bright um, and, and they're farther apart. And you put that all together, you don't have an offset. So the darkness uh, that you experience when you're going down the highway combined with the super bright lights from the other cars and nothing to reduce the contrast often causes blinding situations that I don't know why. But in the United States, when I drive at night, I almost never, maybe two to five percent of the time. So is that almost never? It's not often. Um, when I'm driving at night, I don't experience situations where I'm just hoping there's nothing in the road in front of me because I can't see anything. But here in Nicaragua, it is much closer to 95% of the time that if I'm going to drive at night, there's an assumption that there will be times where someone will blind me with lights to such a degree that I have to trust that there is nothing in front of my car because there's no way for me to see the road at all simply due to the, the blinding lights that are coming at me. So, and to give an example of just how extreme this can be, even without all of those worst factors, right? Eliminate the worst factors, like the blinding lights coming at you in a dirty windscreen, and have only the lack of street lights and the general darkness that's going on and the utter lack of reflectors everywhere. Just a few nights ago, I was on my way to the airport. I was driving down the Pan American Highway. This is the most important road in the country, in the middle of the capital city, just a few miles away from the airport, one of the most important destinations in the city. So it's hard to get much more critical of a thoroughfare than this in the country. And I'm driving in the darkness. Uh, Paul was at the airport. I was going to pick him up. Marcella was riding with me because she was catching a ride with us. And as we're coming down the highway, and she's from Managua, she lives in Managua. We're driving in the darkness and I could sense that there was a little bit too much dark in front of us. And I flipped on the brights and right in front of the car was a barrier, a full on concrete wall designed to keep you from going on down the highway because they had removed the highway and they were diverting you somewhere else. No reflectors, no lights. You had to either guess or have your brights on. And as long as you have your brights on, typically you can see just fine. But when you don't, there's, there tends to be enough ambient light that is not street light that you will not be able to see the road. And that's where it gets really dangerous is that there's so many things on the road that depend on you to have brights on. Because we had lights on and this barrier was 100% invisible totally in the darkness, flipped on the brights, and if it had been five seconds later, it would have been way too late, we would have crashed directly into it. Right? And she screamed, she, was, she had no idea, right? So that's how extreme it can be. That's not erratic driving, that is challenges of driving, and you've gotta be really good. Uh, you have to be very alert. So it, the questions like, is it, is it scary to drive? Is it challenging to drive? Uh, do you have to be super alert? Yes, it is nuts. You've got to be on your game every time you get behind the wheel or you're going to kill someone very possibly yourself. It definitely hit things. Lots of horse-drawn carts with no uh, uh, no reflectors um, out in the in the darkness, right? They're moving super slow. You got to be crazy careful with those. You'll have horses just standing in the road. You got to be ready to slam on the brakes. You got to be ready to swerve. You got to be ready to switch your brights on and off. You got to keep your, keep your windscreen clean um, or that glare is going to kill you. You got to be absolutely alert and you can't get cocky um, but we drive all the time i'm the primary driver uh and and we put on lots of miles we do try to minimize driving at night for sure but i wouldn't say that the drivers are bad i would say that the driving is challenging um, and in managua it's worth noting there are a lot of traffic circles so knowing exactly how to navigate large traffic circles which is even at the best of times can be pretty tough. Um, these are three and four lane circles all over the city. That's how they do things. There's very few street lights. I'm sorry, stop lights. There are uh, semi foros as we call them here. Uh, very few of those in comparison, but lots and lots of circles. Now out in the countryside, like between here and La Paz Centro and between here and Chinandega, we've got circles, but they're more of just traffic slowing devices. They don't really cause any challenge to your driving. Uh, but the ones in Managua with all the lanes and heavy traffic where you got to stop, get in, merge, get out, change lanes, those are the hard ones. Uh, so 
that can add a little bit of challenge as well. But overall, I think the drivers, they have to be good. If you're not good, you're not gonna be able to drive here. And I know people who have failed driving tests here, right? It's not, it's not like they just let you pass. And these are people who have connections and should be kind of waved through, maybe got a little bit easier time, still don't pass. They really do, as far as I know, from what I can tell, they do hold uh, the locals to a certain standard uh, of getting behind the wheel, which is good because it's, it's so risky uh, to do it any other way here. So. That is, uh, that's my take on driving. I wouldn't be absolutely afraid to do it, but I think all of this leads to, if you're going to live in Nicaragua, then driving, and if driving is something that you think you need to do, don't be so afraid of it that you make a decision that, oh, I don't, I don't think I can drive, uh, so I'm gonna make some change in my life plans. And I don't mean like not coming to Nicaragua. I mean like you've decided that it sounds a little bit too scary to drive, so you're gonna just hire a driver. If driving's the right thing for you, I don't think you should be afraid of it. it you gotta be more alert. It's a little bit different. It's always gonna be a little bit different. You will adapt pretty quickly. It's not the end of the world by any stretch. But if you're gonna be here as a tourist or you're here just for a little bit, I would seriously hesitate to recommend driving under normal circumstances. If you're just going from Managua to San Juan del Sur, which a lot of people are, then I would say not a big deal. That road, that entire path, no matter which area you're going, no matter which one you take, and no point gets challenging. You know, there's some heavy traffic, there's a few spots where you gotta navigate through a market potentially, potentially, um, but there's nothing hard, ever, right? Like that's, that's absolutely fine. But if you're going to be, you know, traveling around Managua, driving to different parts of the city. If you're gonna be driving around Granada, around Leon, around Matagalpa, those places are hard to drive. And if you can avoid it, I would consider it. It's not worth going through the learning curve and the fear curve of getting used to it over a one week vacation kind of thing. And it depends on you. Some people, if you've driven in Europe, you're used to it, driving stick is fun for you like it is for me, then eh, maybe it's fine and you'll just enjoy it. And you're gonna be like, Scott, what are you talking about? Yeah, people jump in the front of the road, you gotta pay attention, Psh, whatever. For the majority of people, especially those coming from North America, it is a pretty big difference. And remember, just in case something does go wrong, if you live here, it's generally not a big deal. I have a lawyer to call. I have uh, resources to find out what the law is. You know, if I was to get into trouble, I can be like, hey, is this really what the law is? Did I actually break a law? Is that even a law? Did I break it? Like, I find those things out and I have someone to make sure that yeah, maybe I have to pay a fine, but I'm not gonna go to jail for something that I don't need to, right? I have a lot of protections because I live here. Everyone who lives here has those protections, but if you're on vacation, that's when it becomes a problem. You don't know who to call. You don't have a resource on standby. Um, you're not prepared for those situations and for driving just a little bit, why bother, right? Now I understand that that is, I mean, that's a negative about Nicaragua that you may need to have those resources, but I wouldn't, worry about it in a if i'm looking at relocating to nicaragua you are going to have those resources and it's going to be it's going to be fine we all drive and it's not a big deal we don't think anything of it until someone asks us a question about it but if i was here on vacation it it is just one of those things where that's one of the challenges of the relocation just a small one on a, on a tourist scale it's pretty silly to spend your free time, unless you have an extreme need, uh, doing those things when you could be enjoying the beaches, enjoying the mountains, enjoying the scenery, hire a driver, let them take you around, use public transportation, whatever makes sense for you, and, and spare yourself from how hectic it is and enjoy watching through the windscreen as a professional driver uh, deals with exactly these things. And you, trust me, you will pretty quickly go, I'm glad I wasn't doing that, that was not fun. Right? And for them, it'll be nothing. That's their every day. But for you, it'll be this learning curve that unless the learning curve is fun, that's, that's the one thing. Uh, I don't think it's probably worth it. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, as always, get down there and ask your questions, leave your comments. Um, I've been mentioning this. I'm going to make a video on this shortly. If you want to make a video uh, to send to me that I can put up uh, and so you can ask me questions or leave comments, that'd be fantastic. I'd love this idea. No one's done this yet. So if you want to be the first, that'd be great. Um, but even if you can't do that, just go down below. There's comments. You can ask a question right in there and we can have a conversation there. But often I answer them in video like that's how this one was made. Many of the ones, uh, especially when I'm in a time crunch, like we've had a lot going on this week and I have to do this stuff. I will be driving to Managua in the morning, just in case it matters for anybody. And I have to get this one done early because one of my staff is celebrating her 24th birthday this evening and I'm heading out to the beach to party uh, for her birthday party. Uh, so that is my plans tonight. Uh, if you are interested in sponsoring the channel, of course, that would be very appreciated you can just go on the web to buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It's easy as putting in a credit card and buying me a coffee or two. That comes directly to me and helps make all of this possible. 
if you would be so kind as to like and subscribe. Check out our other channels like Nika Roomba, where we just posted the concert from last night and lots of new concerts will be coming very quickly. Or if you want to see, and this is really cool, I'm going to talk about this in a short soon. Uh, if you want to see 360 degrees uh, views of Nicaragua, Nicaragua 360 is another YouTube channel. And I just started watching this on a VR headset. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. If you have a VR headset, you gotta check out Nicaragua 360. But even if you don't, if you have just your phone, if you have a computer, you can scroll around, look in every direction, but there's something about having the VR headset and being able to actually look around. It's like you're there, which is exactly what you need. Come visit Nicaragua from your VR headset. And, and the more that we get people to do that, the more I can get out there and get more 360 degree views of different parts of the country so you can just explore the country uh, that way. Of course, still come and visit, but it lets you know where you would like to be. Like and subscribe, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.